What's going on guys, Caleb back here with another episode for you for the Chamber Podcast. The Chamber Podcast is all about bringing out this deep down insights you have, the perspective, the mindsets, the outlooks, all of these things that I think each of us are equipped with. I think sometimes it's harder for others to dig down deep and, and grab those out, but I, I'm very interested in what keeps you operating at the optimal level you you operate at um, i'm interested in how you operate and 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 what can we do to to optimize our ability to perform better each and every single day and this is what this podcast is all about this podcast is episode is, is super awesome it's super um cool to be doing it with one of my good friends cody he's like an older brother to me and i'm super excited that him and i sat down to do this podcast if you are watching this podcast, after about 26 minutes or so, the video footage actually crashed and corrupted on me, so you're going to have to just listen from the 26-minute mark and forward, but if you're just listening to this on the audio, don't worry about it, don't worry, you're all taken care of. Enjoy this episode, I recommend you listening to it all the way through, uh, give it a like, share it, leave a comment below, let me know what you guys think of it. Anyways, I won't keep your time any longer. Thank you for listening, and I hope this video helps you one way or another. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, co-worker turned into a good friend. Um, him and I bounced right off the bat. Uh, we connected since the very beginning, developed a great friendship. Uh, I look up to him more than he thinks. And I'm super excited to have him on here. We've been talking about this for probably for the last few months now. Uh, and uh, last week I mentioned that, hey man, I'd love to do it this weekend. He's like, didn't even think twice about it. And so here we are on this podcast. Uh, we're gonna dive right into it. We're gonna talk about passions, things that, what it takes, to, we think that be becoming a man in the process of, of finding your passions, um, some of the difficulties you may face in an encounter. And we're just gonna just jump right into it and see where it takes us. Uh, I believe this podcast is going to be awesome, a lot of good stuff in here, a lot of cool things you guys can look into. So first and foremost, <coughs> welcome Cody Valdez. Hey! Um, good to have you on here, buddy. Uh, super excited to be talking about this. If you just want to give a little bit of background about um, kind of where you came from, things that uh, you've seen in different places you've lived, because I know you lived in a lot of places um, growing up, which is actually pretty, oh, pretty yeah. unique and interesting. But if you want to give everybody a little bit of background about you. Yeah, uh, I'm Cody. I uh, have moved around because my dad was a regional sales. So I've been <clears throat> living in Michigan, Washington State, uh, Illinois, um, and now here. A little bit of Orlando. But I, I don't even really count that. It's less than a year. <laughs> no, no one likes Orlando, really. <laughs> <laughs> but so how did you... How'd you um, end up here in Tennessee. You've been here the longest out of all those places. Yeah, I mean, I moved around a lot, and I always had a, a tight-knit friend group, about four of us, and um, us four, five, six, whatever, hung out every single day. And uh, But I've been with my family my whole life, so when my dad decided to move here, um, it was kind of a no-brainer. I just had to go with them. Yeah. Well... Um, one thing I do know about Cody is how many extreme sports this man has uh, been into. Some of the things, like, there's so many extreme sports that you've just wanted to be That's in. That's all I do. That's all he does. And all the adrenaline it in involves. Um, it's catching up with me now. I'm 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're getting old. I always tell him he's got old man strength. You know, it's funny. But, so if you, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about rock climbing and how that has um, has helped you, like, some of the things that you've encountered doing rock climbing and, like, what that looks like in real life. Like, what are some of the things that you've learned about rock climbing, like, the patience, whatever it is that you can encounter, like, in real sure. life? Yeah, well, like, so rock climbing, I, c I can kind of relate to, to everything that I've done. It's just got that special uh, spice about it, uh, that intensity... And, you know, it is what you make it, but <clears throat> I don't know. I, I just love it. it. It's the difficulty, the problem solving, you know, you, you could potentially fall 20 feet, take a big whipper. <laughs> it's as big as, as what you make it, but what was the question again? 
<laughs> what what are things that you can take away from it that you can implement in real life? So with if you're thinking about rock climbing, I know each step you take actually has to be very articulated. And so one wrong move, one slip, wrong choice. Oh, yeah. Like how how can no, you throw good. that into a, a life perspective per se? Yeah. Um the beauty about rock climbing is just so simple because you try, you fail, you stare at it, you know, you talk to friends and you get what we call beta or, you know, put your hand here, this foot here, adjust your weight like this. And um, you, you can work by yourself or together to get past this, this crazy obstacle, you know, that's lingering 30, 40, 60, 100 feet over your head. So, um, again, just like in life, it's as big as what you're going to make it. And if you're very passionate about rock climbing, you're going to be doing multi-pitch, you know, thousand-foot ascents. Um, and you, you, when you do even thousand-foot ascents, you're doing it with a small group of people, usually at least two people, if not three. So, yeah, I mean, I could probably make a dozen metaphors just off that. <laughs> That's very true. You also said that... Um, You've always had a small friend group, four or five. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, the, the the other beauty about um, about extreme sports, it, it and it started with skateboarding from a young age. You just grow together, and you spend all your time doing this thing, and everybody's fired up, and you will try a hundred times to land a trick, and. Um, you know, when your friend finally lands that kickflip over an eight stair, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody shares it because we all understand we're all going for the same thing. So, um, I'm not gonna find, you know, a team of twenty guys that feel that way that are going for the same thing. You know, just three, three or four, and right. we'll all go together and and we'll figure out what our our personal level is and push our own boundaries and um it you share the stoke right it's amplified i feel like right and one thing i noticed with you like working with you for three years now and like i said like we've connected right off the bat but it's like one thing i've learned from you is you're very patient with people and you're also really good instructing people so it's like you take pride in helping others because i think we share that same intent where Whenever we're helping someone, we're trying to teach them to the best of the ability that we know how to. Yeah. Which is something, I think, very cool and beautiful that a lot of people don't do. It's like, we're very patient with them. We're trying to understand the mistakes they're currently making. And you can't do that with 20 people. Yeah. You know, it's, some, it's a lot different when it's a short, smaller group because now you're developing a closer relationship. Yeah. And it, it becomes actually quite really cool and beautiful how those relationships and things can develop. Rather, if you're in with a group of friends, like 10, 15, 20, and you're trying to do that with everybody, that can be overwhelming. And so I think there's something interesting about having an actually small group of friends that many people don't really pay attention to. Yeah. And you build a more intimate relationship with four people. And right. then, and I think that even intensifies your, your feelings when they achieve success. Like, when my other friends do well, it's intoxicating. Right. That's kind of my lifeblood, really. Right. And that's, that's, that's just, that's so interesting. What the cool thing is about your extreme sports, not only did you do rock climbing, you also do skateboarding. Mm -hmm. You also were doing... Um, snowboarding. Snowboarding. Motocross. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these things that you've done that I, I've never done in my entire life. Oh, I, now I've Cable never... Park. We've been doing. That's very true. I haven't morning. done that with you yet, but I know you did. Oh it. no, we did do it. Remember down in Alabama. Oh, the kale part. I was thinking of the thing you, that you climb on the little skinny wire. What is that called? Oh, slack line. Slack. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. No, we did do the kale part. That was my first time ever doing that too, and that was uh, quite interesting. I think extreme sportsmen, uh, you kind of develop this body awareness, and every uh, every time you get inspired by a new sport, you have. You've already built skill there, so it's like doing something you're already good at. So you just grow really fast. That's why I've gotten into so many different things. But the cool thing is, but why is it, why why extreme sports? Why not something simple like football, basketball, or like something as simple as um, 
I mean, I guess maybe some of those sports aren't simple, but why not just your basic sports? Why is something extreme? And why is that you always resonate with those things rather than just something, I guess, quote unquote, mainstream that normal people would do? I don't like being pitted up against people. I like being pitted up against myself. Okay. We'll elaborate on that. Um, I don't like, I just don't like competition all that much. Like, for example, when I play chess, I'm, I'm happy to lose. And I see it as like a, a growth experience. And um, some people, when they lose, they just, they can't handle it. And I think, I don't know, maybe that came from their personal experiences, but I just don't like being pitted up against. I don't want anybody saying like, you know, you beat me or you cheated or <laughs> I, I don't like the context there. And I guess there's working together to achieve a goal, but... I'd rather it just be a, a personal triumph over, you know, your mental state. Like, I can't, I can't do a double backflip off this 40-foot rope swing. That's just mm -hmm. ridiculous. Who in the right mind would do that? And then you could get out there and your friends are cheering you on and stoked and on pool noodles out in the <laughs> lake. They're like, just hit it, dude. And you're like, ah! So like, it, so it <laughs> sounds like extreme sports is more of individuality than it is about team not in the selfish way but as far as how far can i push myself is yeah. essentially what it's it is going, going beyond what you originally thought you could do i feel like it's just more dynamic it's more artful right that's just uh, instead of you know throwing a football you know you, you nailed a play it was organized everybody did their job mm -hmm. and you achieved the goal it's just they, they just seem fundamentally different different all right, so for those who are watching the video, right behind us, we have a racing simulator, okay? This machine is just like pretty crazy. He hand-built it with a buddy of him. Um, him himself and another engineer built this, all hand-built, everything uh, meticulously measured, created, welded. Um, it's a very cool machine. And for people that are just listening, I want you to talk about that, the things that, what made you interested in a racing uh, machine? What was your idea behind it? Why did you want to do it in the first place? What's your interest in racing and what it means to you? And as far as some of the obstacles you had to overcome, a lot of the hours you dedication, because I know you're building this for quite some time. Okay, this is a huge jump. Huge jump. Yeah. Now it does relate to extreme sports, so we didn't, <laughs> we didn't uh, take an impossible leap here, but <laughs> I love racing. I've always loved racing and I love chess, um, even though you're pitted up against your friend in chess, but uh, yeah. So I'm not independently wealthy. I, I um, have positioned myself well and I can do everything that I want to do in life. Um, probably besides this, besides, besides <laughs> racing, but um, I have always had a sim rig, and I uh, got virtual reality for the first time, and it was just incredible. Uh, it was like you were in the game, and then what we've done with you know, the in in game dynamics of the vehicle is so true to life that you you can really use it in your car on the streets around the racetrack. So I was like, if I can't have all my friends racing in the real world, maybe I can have us all racing in, in the virtual world. And that was the seed, really. That was the power behind the years of work that it took to get this done. So um, uh, after I got the virtual reality machine, uh, I was pretty engrossed into it. I was following a lot of different uh, racing themed pages on Instagram and I come across uh, moving units that it draws telemetry data from the game and turns it into motion uh, while you're playing it. So if you're taking a left-hand turn, your body's getting thrown to the right simulating g <laughs> Which is actually quite insane. This thing will throw you out the seat. This is not just your standard little thing that you can find at Walmart. Yeah, funny story. Uh, <laughs> when we first turned it on, we didn't have any parameters set. And um, my, my mentor during this stage of my life he was drinking somewhat heav heavily <laughs> and got tossed out the seat to the ground. And he's a 40-year-old man. 
<laughs> <laughs> that just goes to show you how powerful this thing is. That's ran by two big motors that are just insane. It's it's ridiculous how cool this thing is. So, but let's let's talk about what what did that look like day to day for you, and what are the things that you started doing? Because I feel like a lot of people, because obviously you love racing, right? It's yeah. something you're passionate about. Yeah. So for people that are passionate about something, but maybe a little bit timid of how to approach it, what are some of the things that you did as far as research goes? What did your day to day look like hourly? Um, when you got home from you know your normal job, like what are the things you did outside of not just your your job, but things you did each and every single day that helped you develop um, your passion your passion for it, but also to learn more about something like that. Because I think a lot of us we sometimes we know what we want and that some of th- we're interested in something, but we don't know some of the conscious steps to actually learn about and take it to a step further. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to think about right now. So I think my day to day looked like. Uh, at the beginning, like I said, I wanted to race with all my friends, so I, I was testing that fire. Because when I get interested in something, I run it by all my friends uh, with passion, it's true. like mountain bikes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, uh, I pretty much was like, guys, can you imagine this? Can you imagine racing side by side and moving machines in a virtual world? Like, that would just be ridiculous, and everybody took on to that. So um, that, was, that was kind of like my flame right there. Uh, talking to everybody during work and uh, the way I started my day is I would listen to you can do it kind of podcasts um, I think just taking that daily bath of motivation right in the morning and then getting to work and uh, building that flame with your friends like just talking about it getting excited you know because I was at work all day anyway and then when I got home um that fire stayed lit until I went to sleep. And I kind of just did stuff every single day to make sure I went home with that fire or that passion to give me the energy uh, to be able to work until I would go to sleep. And I probably did that every day for a year. It's a long time. Yeah. It it doesn't seem like it um, because... I feel like what I was doing was just like just totally worth it and every day I had that achievement going to sleep of moving moving ahead like quite a lot every day you know four hours of work five hours of work yeah it just felt great <clears throat> so it's interesting you said for about a year which is actually <clears throat> maybe re- relatively maybe not long to you but as far as an outlook from it from an outside point of view a year is actually a long time to have a same fire lit the whole time. So how does someone in that year time span, even it can, sometimes someone can get on fire for two weeks, yeah. right? Or a month. Yeah. And how does someone keep that fire lit going? Is it, where's the balance in as far as, because if you can't necessarily do something for 24 hours straight, you're going to get burnt out. Yeah. And a lot of people get burnt out because they're doing too much of it. Yeah. So where what do you what advice would you give someone that has a strong passion for something mm-hmm. and how to keep that flame going without getting too burnt out? Yeah, I guess it comes down to our um uh when you get fired up about something and and you start working towards it, perhaps your uh your goals are too far apart from each other. They're too large. The steps that you need to take to, to um, put wood back on that fire are just too long. Um, okay. So what kept it lit for me was just sharing with other people and, and being excited and getting the affirmation from them being like, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> we need to do that so bad. Uh, I think it's just focusing on those small successes, taking a daily dose of motivation and sharing it and getting affirmation from your peer group, you know, because I'm I'm blessed with um, finding the right people to be around to to get that affirmation um, that who believe in me and we can grow together outside of work, you know. So yeah, I think that's it. Peer group motivation. Uh, from from other professionals, other motivational speakers. 
Yeah. Well, it's cool because <clears throat> so let's change change the uh, question on me, I guess, for example. Um, some of the things that I do to stay on fire. Well, there's a lot of things I think someone can <laughs> can do, and I, I think every situation is different for each individual. And um, you know, sometimes I never want the point across. I never want to say something to someone as if like, if you don't do this, then this is not going to work for you. I always feel like just providing possible solutions for people is always my idea and plan to go. You know, there's never like, if you don't do this, this is not going to work, or you have to do this. If you don't do this, it's not really about that with. With any of the videos I make or just in general, it's always about just providing possibilities for someone to use. And that's all this is. And so for me, at least since I was nine, 10 years old, just a quick background, I've always been super motivated. I've always been inspired to to be someone who was impactful. I've always been um, just driven. And I don't actually know exactly where that came from. I just know since I was nine, 10 years old, like literally Cody, I would go on Google and type, <laughs> this is gonna kind of sound so cheesy. I would go on Google and type in like, like motivational quotes on Google and I would read all these quotes oh, yeah. for 20, 30 minutes. I've done that. Yeah. And then I would re-erase it and type in inspiring quotes and get a whole different result. Yeah. <laughs> but so I'm like 12, 13 years old reading this like all the time and I would do this all the time and all the time. And so it's like, I'm a big fan of you have to feed yourself positivity. Mm -hmm. And what's, what you said I think is actually really important is you essentially said the log was too big for the fire, right? We could almost, it can't burn. It's something so big, it's too big for the fire. And so I think it's one, A, important to have big goals, but also off that big goal, you have to have small goals, goals and achieve those. And not only do you have to achieve those same things, but also reward yourself for achieving them. Mm -hmm. And you, you just have to become very clear of, of the direction you want to go to, but don't focus too much on how the path looks exactly. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, it's really about adapting. It's ever changing. Oh, yeah. It's ever changing. Yeah. And so I think <laughs> that's something I think you and I share a lot of is because we talked, well, almost as sidetracks. Like when you talk about with your friends and you guys are hanging out, I remember you saying it's like you almost don't like having a plan. And essentially, like you don't like, hey, nine o'clock, nine to 10, we're doing this. From 11 to 30, we're doing this. From 12 to one, we're doing this. You're kind of like, hey, let's all get together, collectively think of something and just do it. And then if this doesn't work, we think about it and then do this. Yeah. But like a lot of people aren't like that. Yeah. They're like, they're, they're so structured on goals. And it's like, how could Carl be late? <laughs> it's 9.07. <laughs> <laughs> it's like life happens. The car could kind have of gotten, it could have been an ambulance, right? And so it's like, it's like just being adaptive. I think of being adaptive and being open to that allows that fire to stay lit, to come back to the original question. It's like you, you can't hold yourself to the point where it's like, if you don't accomplish this, then this end of the world. It's like, okay, I didn't maybe accomplish it on, right, on this time. Maybe I, maybe I missed my goal. But at least, here's the key thing in this, at least you took those steps to still acquire, to accomplish that goal. Because a lot of people don't even do that. And so I think that's what's so interesting is that just how adaptive, I think you and I both are, in, in, in setting that big goal, but also just trying to achieve those small goals each and every single day. Sure. Yeah, those of you who uh, watch Caleb, he's like that all the time. <laughs> uh, that's why I love him. Uh, every day at work, He's he's kind of the, brings the stoke, not as not like Reeve. Not like Reeve. Reeve's no. special, <laughs> the king of the call. Reeve Reeve is that one guy in the group that will do anything, and I know everybody has that one friend. Like, if you ask him to do it, he won't even think about the consequence. He'll be like, "Bro, where do you want me?" And we're all like, "No, for the love of God, <laughs> sit down." He can't even ride his bike in a parking lot. Without falling down. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but he's always happy. And that's that's the kind of people, you just share that stoke, you know, get fired up. And if you're not fired up, you have to have the power to find that within yourself, you know, that intrinsic motivation. Like, some, some people it's just not so obvious. And for those of you who don't know what you want to do, you know, you're not going to find it 
unless you get out and go <laughs> go meet people. Go to, you know, the five spot in Nashville. It's a swing, swing dance spot. I mean, you'll find people to talk to. You, you need to get out and, you know, live, live life. You know, look at what you do every day. If you just go to work and go home and play video games with your friends, you know, get out to go try rock climbing. Just give it, just give it a go. Go, go to a freaking, um, no, cart con player soft. One thing, a great takeaway that I experience every day from hanging out with Caleb is he's excellent at um, realizing what he needs to do and adopting that and accepting it and creating new habits. So, um, and yeah, like I'm just blessed by my peer group. I'm, I'm blessed by having a peer group that inspires me. You know, there's, there's give and take here. Uh, so, I guess my question to you is, so, okay. The one thing about Caleb is uh, he, he's always able to adopt good habits. He, he's ever-changing, and I think he really kind of realized the man you, you want to be, and I think that's probably your motivation. But what possesses you to be able to wake up at 5 a.m., get up, go to the gym, and, and keep that going? Because you've been doing that for how long? It's probably for a little over a month now. Yeah, and that's hard. I've done that's it. very hard. It's very hard. It's very hard. <laughs> well... <clears throat> So first and foremost, waking up at 5 a.m. to me has actually been one of the hardest things I actually had to do, okay? And I've tried it multiple times, so many times I've tried doing that. And sometimes I'll do it successfully for two, three days, maybe even a week. And then that one day that I stayed up too late possibly or I wake up and I just, I just want to hit snooze and go back to bed. That still happens. <laughs> that feeling of getting up, you hear that alarm, you're like, dude. Are you serious right now? I just want to go back to bed. I do not want to get up. My my face is crusty. My lips are crusty. Can't even open my eyes. Do you it, know how I'm long warm. it takes to create a new habit? How many days is it? There's so many different answers, but I think I think it's anywhere from all the answers I've heard is anywhere from 21 days or 21 days to 90 days. Okay. Like I've heard the stretch. No, you're at to, you're at, you're at 37 <clears throat> days. Just about. Yeah. So the 21 days is out the window. Correct. <laughs> yes. We're going for the 90 days. You're going for the 90 <laughs> days. Yes, we're trying to get there. Um, well, it's fun, so funny. So I'm learning a lot right now at the moment. I think um, why I'm waking up at 5 a.m. is for a numerous reasons. One, the first reason, the most obvious reason, is to, um, to work out, is to get that out of the way, and I'm done. Because what I used to do, as you know, I would work. Obviously, we would work from 9 to 5. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes go home. So the gym is five minutes from where I work. I would go home, change, get a, change my clothes, chill out for an hour, and then I go back to the gym at eight or nine and work out for an hour, hour and a half. And it's 10, 11 o'clock, and then I would go to bed and do it again. Um, and so the, all that took my time up. There was never a time where I didn't somewhat have a structure. I would just go home, and I feel like I was wasting my time, um, a lot of that. So... I wanted to start inquiring, working out in the morning, so I had more free time to go home. And once I left to work, I was home. I didn't have to leave. The second thing of why I wanted to wake up in the morning at 5 a.m. is because the, the benefits it actually brings you. There's so many benefits, and there's so many things that people can go in depth about. So the driving force there is the belief. <clears throat> well, I'll get into that point right there. I'm getting to that. I'm almost there. So the second reason, like I was saying, is to... Um, not only to wake up at 5 a.m., but also because it can really boost your confidence, boost your um, self-awareness. There's all of these like proven scientific facts. And the one thing that makes this really interesting more than anything, um, the reason why my belief where it stems from is because all these highly successful people, you're talking about millionaires, billionaires, these very top five, one percent, the 10 percent people of whatever industry it is. The, almost every single thing they have in common is waking up in the morning, 4 or 5 a.m., right? And so I looked at it as like, I looked at, <clears throat> I look at that and, and, and figure, well, if they're doing this, 
why are they doing this, right? What what makes waking up earlier before your day technically gets started? Where does that benefit come from? And I found a few things. The first thing is you're almost you're distraction free. Everybody is asleep. So right then and there, when you wake up and you consciously understand that what you're about to do, you're doing when everybody is asleep, already gives you somewhat of endorphin and motivation like, hey, I'm up in the morning and no one else is awake. And so that gives you a little bit of confidence there. But also when you start working out, at first you don't wanna do it, but once you work out and you're completed, you feel really good about yourself. It releases endorphins, you did something when you didn't wanna do it, and now you're awake, your whole body's awake, you're alert, and a lot of the times during all this, <clears throat> I'm listening to something motivational to get my drive going, to continue to do what I needed to do. Um, it just, it drives my day, for, it just drives everything for the rest of the day when I'm waking up early in the morning. And like I said, I literally try to do this for, for so long and it's so hard to do, so it's not easy by any means, but success leaves clues behind. And so I want to continue to do that to the best of my abilities to wake up in the morning because there's a lot of people doing it and a lot of benefits that you can seriously reap from waking up in the morning. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that relates to the ultimate goal. You know what that is. Right. Realizing your potential. And if you can't do that for yourself, <clears throat> you know, I can do that for my friends. Mm -hmm. for, that's, you know, because nothing, nothing's great by yourself. Like playing video games, you know, I can't, I can't really get inspired if, if I'm alone. So that comes back to the friends group. You just, I'm inspired by the people around me and I'm pushed by the people around me to be the best that I can because by myself, I'm a mess. <laughs> I like that. That's actually a good line right there. <laughs> by myself, I'm a mess. And, that's, and I think that's also another thing we have in common is that essentially what we do is usually for someone outside of us. It's for your case, it's exactly for your friends. Um, but it's like, why is that important? Why is that important to really like your potential? Why is that if, if you can do something, if you're chasing after your goals, chasing after your dreams, why do you think it's important to at the, at the end, very end of the day, the reason why you're doing that is for someone else and not just for you? Well, it's just, it's the way I've lived my whole life. I think uh, just experiencing that, that growth with each other, like I, it's almost like the meaning of life to me. Like in, in those 10 seconds, <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just that's that's when I'm happiest. So you know, you know, work's great and life's great, but I always know deep down that I'm positioned to have those experiences again. And uh, yeah, I think you know, grandparents live live on through their kids. It's you know successes and failures but like the extreme sports you get that same thing but in a much tighter condensed experience so like when it happens just huge Seems like. it's it's very interesting that <clears throat> like a lot of the things you're talking about <clears throat> doing extreme sports right you love the push you love the potential that it brings you love getting on the edge you also love having a small group of people um, and getting information from them and, and pushing yourself and, and, and jo enjoying things with your friends. And also, it, it's the simplicity of <clears throat> just doing it for others. But what would you tell someone who, who's doing it for themselves, like just for their personal self-gratification? What do you think happens when they accomplish their goal and they're just doing it only for them and not for anybody else because i think there's a lot of people doing that yeah. it's like why do you want a big house for me i want to look cool it's like why do you want just a lamborghini because it just look cool and i know it was joked with you like talking about a yacht and everything oh yeah but <laughs> but it's like why do you like no, it's, it could be like the way people are raised you know but how, how would someone get out I, of that Huh? How would someone get out of that? Get out of that thought process? Right. 
doing selfless selfless act like um, uh, let's say let's say you went over to you know an Asian country and just helped out rebuilt somebody's home you know do something completely out there uh, unfamiliar and and help people see see how that makes you feel uh, you to to get like a serious change like that, a, a shift in perspective, you have to be hit hard. I feel like. So. <clears throat> you think hit hard, um, maybe both physically or or mentally. Yeah, I guess it it could be emotionally. Different. It could psychology wise, it could be different for everybody, but. Uh, yeah, to to receive like a massive shift in your belief system, and you know to shake you out of you know your childhood where your dad didn't accept you, you're never good enough, you know whatever had has happened to you, you just I don't know you you need that shift or you need uh, a understanding of psychology to be able to. Uh, reflect, uh, to meditate and dig deep, and to see where you went, to see what's going wrong. You know, I think understanding psychology is probably one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself. I agree. I mean, you, you can. You're the, you're your worst enemy. It's absolutely <laughs> true, and I I just think that understanding psychology, like exactly what he said, but. What he said earlier also, too, I think would also give you um, getting doing something for someone else. And as he was saying, just go out and do things. Go out to, you know, a, a, a club or go out and rock climb. Like doing these things and meeting people from all different backgrounds is actually one of the coolest things. And it's something that I have finally come to like senses with that I need to do more of because it's like. In my mind, I'm very picky about the people I actually associate with, which is, I think, probably something you understood at first when I started working here. I was very careful of where I spent my time. And or it what was, you even told us. Huh? Or what you even told us, yeah. <laughs> because, and, and it's not like, it's not anything that's... A, he wasn't trying to be secretive. He just didn't want, he, did, he didn't, like, we weren't good friends yet. So he didn't trust us with that information. He didn't want us to hurt, you know, that that progression by get, throwing our beliefs into the mix. Well, it's not. <clears throat> maybe that was part of it, but also it was just like I know for myself, I'm very. Um, well, I guess a lot of it is true. It's like I'm very careful about what things are in my life because I'm very easily influenced. And so I think we all are, yeah. Before I know somebody, like I have to know how is their heart? Where are they being genuine with the things they're they're doing in their life? Are they coming from something perspective where I can learn from? Because I, th I think so many of us associate with people that really don't do us any good. And the basis of that is emotional intelligence. Huge. And understanding uh, psychology, your own psychology. Understanding your own psychology. Anyways, guys, well, I think we're going to end the podcast there. A um, lot of takeaways from this. If so, after everything we talked about, what are a few things, one or two things that you think people should start doing to either, one, change your psychology, um, or two, to continue to chase after their passion? Yeah. yeah I think you need to, you need to reflect on your time spent in your relationships and if you have toxicity in your life um, you know it might be the hardest point of growth but you need to figure out why it's toxic uh, if that means digging deep seeing a psychologist or reading psychology books and um, uh, maybe like emotional intelligence books you know all, all that stuff and you could just you need to maximize, you need to maximize life. Um, make sure that what you're doing is life well spent. It's one of my favorite things. Anytime we do something 
really fun. I say, man, that was life well spent. That was a good time. <laughs> it was. And what do you come back to? You're like, I want to do it again. You guys, when are we going next time? <laughs> yeah. Because in the end, it's all about relationships and who you surround yourself by. It is. That's, that's really, and that's important. That's a huge thing. It is really all about relationships because what is something you don't take with you to the grave? Money. What is something do you take with you to graves? Memories and experiences, right? And the things that, how you impacted people is what you leave behind. Yeah. The, the quote is, somebody's, not everybody's always gonna remember what you said, but everyone's always gonna remember how you made them feel, right? And so it's about relationships. And so if you're always impactful in your case, helping people, instructing people, doing extreme sports, bringing people to be better than what they think are, reaching your full potential. I mean, it's like you're setting your friends up for great success. And this is the reason why I think like a lot of, the, a lot of your friends are actually very successful. Yeah. You're, you're in a group with people who do great things, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, I think that's what's helped you too tremendously just overall in the person you are today. You've been surrounded with people who are, who are chasing after big goals or they're doing really big things. And I think that's just really made you who you are today. Sometimes it seems like, is that by chance? <laughs> it can't be by chance. <laughs> I don't think every. I think some things happen by chance, but I do think we have a lot of control over that. Yeah. You just get, you lock yourself up. You just need to dig deep. Need to dig deep. Anyways, guys, thank you for listening to Cody and I. This was our first podcast together. I'm sure we're going to do a lot, of, a lot more of this, talk about a lot more different things as, as time goes on. Um, great working with him, man. I, I enjoyed <clears throat> working with him, looking up to him each and every single day. Great, humble dude. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. See ya. Peace. <sighs> That was good. That was good.